This man stood three stories above the 401. He was yelling at his cell phone to his former wife who was on the other end. He threatened. He said I would, he would kill his five-year-old daughter, which he was holding in his arms, for the purpose of getting back at his wife for their divorce. This was no idle threat, though. He did it. He threw his daughter off the overpass of one of Canada's busiest highways, and then he jumped off the bridge himself. What would cause a man to do that? What would cause a man who was divorced from his wife to want to kill his own child? Separation from the one he loved? Separation from the one who once loved him? A broken relationship? Hurt? Pain? Wanting to have revenge and cause pain to someone else in the most cruel way that you could. But what if there was something different? What if those two parties could be brought together? What if instead of revenge, there was reconciliation? You see, as humans, we're wired for revenge. It would be like, not me, I'm not like that. But then you just look at the movies we watch. At the end, we're always happy when the bad guy dies and the good guy wins. And we're even more happy if the bad guy dies in a really bad way. Movies create these grandiose ways in which we, the bad guy can die at the end. And you always know he's the bad guy because he hits a kid or he kicks a dog. But you and I are wired for revenge. Our natural instinct is to get back at people. We always want to make sure that the bad guy gets, gets what he deserves and we're the good people, right? We're never seeing ourselves as the bad guys. We're the good people. We don't, we don't deserve that. That's for the bad guy. As Christians, we're called to something different. Not revenge, we're called to reconciliation. Reconciliation is something described as the end of hostility between two alienated parties either man and God or man to man. In fact, it's one of the primary, if not the primary, reason why Christ comes. In Ephesians, I've been talking about this through our, our study that we've been going through, is the reason why Jesus comes is for reconciliation. Jesus came so that he could reconcile all creation to himself and to God the Father. And so Christ has united the people from all the nations to himself, and he is then creating for himself as we are united to one another in his church. This is what he does in Ephesians. You and I, who were once far off, have now been brought near to God. If you are to remember what you were like, in Ephesians 2.11, we spoke about this. Remember, you were formerly, who were Gentiles. By birth were called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision. We were once enemies of God, dead in our transgressions, as it says in 2 verse 1. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were foreigners without hope and without God. We had no hope in the Messiah, and we worshipped idols. We were God's enemies. But because of God's love for us, it says in verse 4, we were saved. Saved by grace through faith. Why? Because God, his rich kindness and his grace, he purchased our freedom. How? With the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. Why and how? To forgive our sins. And so now God has taken these people, which were not his, and he has reconciled us to himself. You see, in the Old Testament, they had the law to follow. They followed the law. They were known as the chosen people, the people of God. We were outside of that. But God has reconciled for himself a people from all of the world under Christ. And this brings me to Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 18. And if you have your Bible, you can follow along with me or follow on the screen. This is the purpose of what Jesus Christ came to do and what he has done for us. We were once enemies of God, but now, in Christ Jesus... You who were once far away have been brought near. How were we brought near? Near through the blood 
of Christ. It's through the blood of Christ that Christ reconciles us to the Father. Where we were once enemies, now he has paid the payment for our sin, and we are now brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two, right? Jew and Gentile. He has made the two into one, and he has destroyed the barrier that separated us, the dividing wall of hostility. He did this by abolishing in his flesh the law with all of its commandments and regulations. And here's his purpose. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. Thus, he makes peace. And in this one body, this is what he does, to reconcile both of them to God. How? Through the cross. Right? We are reconciled to God through the cross. Not our own righteousness, not our own works. He does it through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Right? There's no, no more hostility between us and God because Christ paid for that. Right? But there should also be no hostility between us as Christians. Why? Because we both are saved the same way. And then he describes, he came, this is Jesus, and preached peace to you, you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. We were the far away ones, the Jews were the ones who were near. For through him, we both now have access to God the Father by one spirit, the spirit that dwells in each one of us as Christians. That is what Christ does for us. The reason why this is transformative, the reason why this is life-changing, is prior to Christ, right, your life is like a tumultuous sea. The word that describes the animosity that we have between God or the enmity that we have between God and ourselves is like a rolling or a roaring sea. Jesus comes and when he brings in us this peace that we now have with God, that, that sort of roaring sea is not in us anymore. When you've been a Christian for a while, you sometimes forget what life was like without God. Sometimes you forget what life was like when you had no peace with God. But through Christ and what he has done, he has now made the peace for us. And so here is the supreme and primary need of all of us is to have peace with God, but also for peace with one another. This is why reconciliation is so important in the way of what Christ has done, but also the call for us in our own lives. You see, back in the day, back when Jesus was around, there was this, if you wanted to approach God at the temple, you had, if you were a Gentile, you were only allowed in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. That's what it was known as. And there was an inscription on the wall. And the inscription on the wall kind of went something like this. It said, Gentiles, if you attempt to enter into the interior part of the temple, you will be blamed. It will be on yourself for your own death if you pass into the inner court. There was a dividing wall. There was no way for us as, as Gentiles to enter into the presence of God or to even have a relationship with God because we were outside. We were the uncircumcised. We were the far ones away. But through Christ, his purpose was to create in himself one man from the two, Jew and Gentile, and he makes peace through his body, which is the church. And so what this does for you and I is not only does it change our relationship with God, but it also changes the relationship that you and I have with one another. And so I want to share with you something that is transformative in your life. If you will just hear me out today, I am going to share with you what it means to live in Christian reconciliation. And I guarantee you, it will change the way that you have relationships with others. It will change the way that you have relationships with your friends, your wives, your husbands. It, ha it changes the relationships that you have with your children. It changes the relationships that we have with one another in the church. And this is what Christ gives us to do. And this is what it comes down to. It comes down to one very key point when it comes to reconciliation. And so this is the ministry that we get, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. And just listen to the words of what he says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is anyone in Christ? Okay. If you are in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come, right? We're created into this new man. 
All this is from God, who, so God did this, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and then he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. Right? The ministry of reconciliation is given to the church and is given to us as individuals. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he is committed to us, right? To us. He is committed the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though, <coughs> sorry, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Drink here. So this is what this means for us. If you and I are to live a ministry of reconciliation, if you and I are reconciled to God, which we claim to be through Christ, how does that work in our lives? It's all done through the cross. So let's look at the cross as an example. What does this mean for you and I? While we were sinners, while we were God's enemies, right? While we hated God, Christ died for us, right? That's what happened. That is what Christ did to reconcile us to the Father. So in this scenario, who is the one who is the offended? The offended one is God himself. We are the offenders. We are the idolaters, the, adult, the adulterers. We are the ones who have worshipped other gods. We have gone after other things. But even while we were sinners, Christ chose to die for us. That is what he did. He chose to reconcile us to the Father through his work. And even though he is the offended one, he is the one who came to you with the olive branch, with the branch of peace, and said, look, I have provided a way for you to be reconciled to the Father. And if you will come to me, you will be brought near to God. And you will have a relationship with God. And he came to your door and he knocked on that door and he asked you to open it. And he said, I'm offering you peace. Peace between you and God. Not living in this sort of turmoil, there's tumultuous sea in you, but I will give you peace with the Father. And through me, you will know that you have a relationship with God the Father. And this is what I'm offering to you. And you opened that door and you said, that sounds like something I need. I need to be made righteous in Christ. I need forgiveness of the sin that I have. And that is what was offered to you. And so now you, who is a Christian, have a ministry. A ministry, as he says here, of reconciliation. So as Christians, here's the difficult part. If you are the offended one, you can no longer sit back and say, you know what? That person offended me. I'm not... I'm not I'm done with them. I'm never going to talk to them again. Not, a, not an option for you now as a Christian. Because even when you're the offended one, you're called to be like Christ. And you're the one who is to go and to reach out and to give the olive branch of peace. Even if you're the offended one. Not the one who has done the offense. If you've done the offense, you should be doing that as well. But reconciliation is, even if you've been the offended one, you need to be the one who reaches out. And the reason why I love this is because as your pastor, I'm going to offend you one day. It'll happen. We live together in the church. I guarantee you there's going to be a day where I do something wrong. It's on you to come to me. I know you laugh, but it's true. Because when that happens, you and I as Christians, this is how the church works. This is the example that we have to our community. It's the example that we have to our families. And I guarantee you, there is someone here today who has a relationship that needs to be reconciled. 
It might be with a family member. It might be with somebody at work. It might be a friend. And maybe you're the offended one. And maybe you've been waiting. You've been like, you know what? I'm not doing anything until that person comes to me. Not an option for you. It's not an option for you because while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. In fact, this is so important to Jesus that he says to us, don't even come with a gift to the Father. Don't come here and bring your gift unless you have reconciled things. Like if you have something, if someone has something against you or you have against someone else, go. Don't even bring your gift. Go deal with that first and then come to the Father. That is how important it is that Jesus talks about this. This is why Jesus says, love your enemies. If someone does evil to you, do good for them. This is the call that you are called to as a Christian. This is what we are to do. This is what the ministry of reconciliation is in actual sort of way that it plays out. And here's what I can guarantee to you, Christians. If you do this, if someone has offended you and you decide, I'm going to reach out, even though they have offended me, I'm going to reach out and try and bring peace between us and reconcile because Christ did that for me. I'm going to do it for them. I'm going to try. I guarantee you there's going to be a time where you reach out that olive branch. You reach out your hand for, 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 to offer peace and that person will slap your hand away. It's going to happen. I'm not promising you that everything is going to work out well for you when you do this, because it doesn't always. But at least you tried. And here's what you know. Every day, your Savior does this for everybody in this world. Every single day, Christ has provided a way to bring peace between his Father and us. And every day, he reaches out his hand for peace. Every day, he knocks on that door, and he says to people, look, if you come to me, I will bring you peace. There will be reconciliation between the Father and yourself, and you will have a right relationship with God through the forgiveness of sins that is offered to you through the blood that I already paid. It's already done. The work is finished. It's for you. You can come to the Lord, and you can receive that. And every day, people say to him, I could care less, and they slap his hand away. It happens to him every single day. And in fact, I guarantee everyone in this room has done it at one point or another. Guarantee there was a time where Christ came to you and you turned your back on him. Guarantee it has happened. Or you've worshipped another God. Or you turned your back on him. Or you have not even decided that God was important enough for your time. And that's the reality of what Christ does for us every single day. So if your Savior, savior does it, if your savior, savior brings reconciliation... He calls us to a ministry of reconciliation. And it is through us that God is making his appeal to this world. And so somehow, through the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit that works in you, that is your calling. And so you, when you go out there as a Christian, and when you bring reconciliation to a place where reconciliation doesn't look like it's something that can happen, people will see the divine work of God. People will see that there is something different about you. There's this story about a, a man who is in, in Paris, and he's a, 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 a fabulous, wonderful painter. He lives about an hour outside of Paris. And one day, there's an emergency at his house, and so he, he calls up a doctor who lives in Paris, the best doctor that, that's in Paris, and he says, I need you to come over. We have an emergency in our house, and I need a doctor here right away. And the doctor is busy. It's, it's late at night. He's like, okay, I'll make it if it's an emergency. And when he gets there... He realizes that the painter has invited him there because his dog has broken his leg. And so he takes the dog's leg. He's mad. He's angry. He sets the dog's leg, and he goes home, and he stews about it. He's like, I got to get back at that guy. I need revenge. I've been, I've been, I've been unrespected or disrespected. I, I need revenge. So he comes up with this plan, and about a month later, he calls up the painter, and he says, oh, I, I have some work I need to, for you to do. I need a paint, I need painting done. And so the, the, the painter says, fine, I'll be over, and he comes over the next day. And the doctor says, okay, um, I have this wall. You see this wall? I need that painted, and I need this wardrobe painted. If you could just put a, a slap, a coat of paint on that, that would be wonderful. And the painter realizes what he, what he had done. He had disrespected this doctor. And he knew that this doctor was going to 
try and get revenge on him at that time. And just painting a wall would, you know, was just wasting his time. So he had two options. He, he could then escalate this and seek revenge if he wanted. Or he could try and reconcile the situation. So for the next number of weeks, the painter would show up every day. And he began to paint on that wall and on that wardrobe and the two front doors some of his best work that he has ever painted, a beautiful landscape. The doctor could never pay him for the work that would be done, and it would be priceless when he was finished. But what occurred there was reconciliation. In your life, God has given you a gift that you can't pay for. He has reconciled you to himself through the work of what Christ has done on the cross. You can't pay for it. You can never do enough good works to, to buy it back. And out there, there is maybe someone who has wronged you enough and could never pay it back, and maybe they're even afraid to come to you because they don't know how to ask for forgiveness. And maybe you hold the keys to make that relationship right again. Your calling, your ministry, is to remember this. While you were a sinner, while you were God's enemy, Christ died for you. If Christ did that for you, the very least we can do is reconcile with others. Let us pray. Father, you have given us a, a specific task is to have all things reconciled under Christ for the glory of God. And so, Lord, some of that reconciliation happens through the work of your people who have been reconciled to you. That if we have hate in our hearts for our brothers, Lord, then there is no love of God in us. Because you have called your people to love, your, love our enemies. You have called your people to do good when others do bad to us. And you have called your people to reconcile with those who have harmed us. And Lord, we know that this does not always turn out well. But Lord, we are called to try. We are called to share the good news of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us so that others might come into relationship with you. And we, who are brothers and sisters in Christ, are reconciled not only to yourself, but to one another, because you have done great things for us. May we be people who reconcile. Pray this in Christ's name, and all God's people said.